Howdy, partner. So, now we know what the core conflict at the centre of Warhammer the Old World is going to be. And it's not order versus chaos, light versus darkness, or even good versus evil. It's core versus PDF legacy. I'm going to try and work out what that means in another one of my little monologues. Yes, I know it's about four days later than everyone else. Food takes a long time to prepare around here, and it's served in a banquet over many courses, and creates a lot of washing up. So, we've now been told who's in and who's out, faction-wise. And in, we have a Dwarven Mountain Holds, Kingdom of Britonia, Wood Elf and High Elf Realms, the Empire of Man, Orc and Goblin Tribes, Warriors of Chaos, Beastmen Brayherds, and the Tomb Kings of Kemri. And in the out column, in other words, the PDF legacy column, we've got demons, dark elves, skaven, ogres, lizard men, and chaos dwarves, obviously. So, with this announcement, Games Workshop, I think, have clarified really quite fundamentally some of the really important kind of questions that we had about Warhammer the Old World and its focus. Recall that we've been shown some art from Kislev. We had some strong hints that Grand Cathay might be getting an army. And for all we knew, all of the factions that were seen, as in Warhammer 8th edition, all were going to get army books, potentially miniatures, everything could be on the menu. And probably that was a little bit too good to be true. And this announcement represents perhaps the first kind of dose of slightly hard reality and maybe pragmatism uh, that we're going to perhaps have to get used to as we wait hopefully not too much longer for this game. But I think that if you do read the announcement from Games Workshop and take a few steps back from it, it's possible to put it into perspective. I should say that in discussing this, my scepticism is definitely growing. As you'll see, when I made a video about three years ago when they announced Warhammer the Old World, I was super, super positive, and I continue to be positive. But at the same time, there are certain doubts that are rising in my mind, and I find myself slightly sliding, sliding into the skeptics column. But anyway, let's preserve some objectivity and look at the nature of this announcement. So just a few things before we talk about this core versus PDF legacy business. And the first is that we have this list of good and evil factions. Now, I'm not really sure I really agreed with this when I saw it, because we've got good being the Bretonians, Wood Elves, High Elves, uh, Empire and Dwarves, bad Orcs and Goblins, Warriors, Beastmen and Tomb Kings, all these new fancy names like Dwarven Mountain Holds and High Elf Realms that they've now been given, which sounds a bit Age of Sigmar to me, but I can let that one slide. So, are Orcs and Goblins evil? Or are they just merely chaotic? Are Tomb Kings evil? Yeah, they're undead, but why is a skeleton necessarily bad? And Wood Elves? Are Wood Elves good or evil? Sure, they used to be good, but in the 8th Ed book, they got a bit weird and postmodern and kind of had light magic and dark magic kind of at the same time. So I didn't really like that binary, but then they corrected the image and got rid of the good versus evil binary. So maybe they were listening. One of the other things they say um, is that they say there is no Age of Sigmar crossover. And that's something I think quite important because I think many people did believe that you know, some of the new kind of Age of Sigmari kind of units, like, for example, the Cadrian Overlords or those strange cow-like elf, high elf creatures and various other things that I confess I'm not particularly interested in and I haven't taken the time to look at, might find a place in Warhammer the Old World. And that's not the case. They're preserving that thematic divide between Age of Sigmar and Warhammer the Old World. I like that. I think that's nice. Um, it means that the two universes have that kind of distinct difference. And it's not the case that they're allowing Age of Sigmar players an easy bridge over into the old world that they might have got by using their Age of Sigmar miniatures, you know, mounted on, you know, equivalent sort of spacer trays. 
And I thought that's something they might well do, and they're not doing that. Now, I know some Age of Sigmar models are kind of the legacy 8th edition models, uh, like some of the Empire Free Cities models, I think they're called. And so Age of Sigmar players will be in an interesting situation where if they've got some armies, they might find them largely portable to 8th edition, um, but some of them won't be. So... It's a bit like, I guess, you know, demon players used to have in fantasy that they could actually use their models also in 40k. And so some Age of Sigmar factions with some troop choices will have that bleed across, but they will be thematically quite separate. And as I say, I quite like the fact that they're making these two games um, separate. They also say that... Um, or imply that uh, units that were around in the final edition of Warhammer Fantasy will have rules, even if they are only in these free PDFs. Now, I don't know, does that mean that end time units are going to have them? Does it mean we're going to get putrid blight kings and storm fiends are going to have rules in this PDF legacy? You know, does that mean, I don't know, monstrous arcanum and storm of magic are going to get it? I'm not sure. I guess we'll have to see. But it does seem that it is a priority to them to provide rules for all of the things that were around at the end of 8th edition. And again, I quite like that because there is at least some um, feeling that they're trying to sustain all of the world that was, as they like to call it, at the end of 8th edition and to allow all of the odd models that people might have to find representation in the game. So that's all very nice. Right, let's talk about the main dish here. And that's this core factions versus PDF legacy factions. So, again, let's first start with some positives. I like the fact that there's going to be emphasis on the Bretonians. There's going to be emphasis on the Tomb Kings. There's going to be emphasis on Beastmen. Tomb Kings were, well, they weren't neglected with army books, but they were just a very weak army. Bretonians haven't had an army book out for 20 years, and Beastmen also haven't had, you know, a great time of things as well. So some of those factions that didn't get a lot of TLC in 8th edition are getting some now and that's just you know a nice kind of redressing of the scales there I uh, I think so I'm uh, I'm certainly a big a big fan of that I also think that they said a little bit more about the setting that it's going to be set before the great war against chaos before the siege of prague at a time when chaos is really rather weak that there aren't really demons around sure there's some mortal chaos but it's at a pretty low ebb. And the emphasis is going to be on the border princes, where we're going to have, you know, various humans fighting orcs and that kind of thing. Now, that's quite interesting in a sense. It's a nice change in focus, isn't it? Away from, you know, Archaon collecting his stuff and the war be and the world being on the brink of destruction continually. It also means there's probably no big baddie exactly. Because if you're not having demons and sort of chaos are slightly de-emphasized, You've not got, you know, the horned rat. You've not got Cain. You've not got exactly a really malicious kind of evil god in the world. Because, you know, I know they went and said orcs and goblins and tomb kings were evil. Or indeed, even beastmen were evil. I'm not really sure they're evil in that kind of sense of the sort of world domination, genocide-y kind of horrible way that some of those other kind of gods are. So maybe there won't be, you know, such a, a good versus evil dynamic. Um, despite their good and evil factionizing that they am uh, corrected. Right, let's move on to some of the sceptical kind of stuff, and there's quite a lot of this. So first things first, guys, obviously, look, if you're a Lizardman player, if you're a Dark Elf player, you know, if you're an Ogre player, if you love those armies, and you're being told that they're effectively a second string, that they're now PDF legacy factions, that they aren't going to get, you know, presumably army books, they're not going to get new models, they're not going to be the focus of any of the kind of um, supplements. And, you know, that's understandably disappointing if you are a fan of some of those armies, which are some of the, probably the most popular Warhammer armies are in there, certainly with, say, Dark Elves or Demons. And, you know, I can completely understand you being disappointed. I'm all right. My two armies are Warriors of Chaos you know, and Bretonians, and I'm starting a Wood Elf army as well. So, you know, I'm covered in that regard. But, you know, other people who have these PDF legacy armies perhaps feeling a little bit cheesed off, to put it mildly. Now, let's add a few caveats on there. First of all is the word yet. Maybe these PDF legacy factions will get attention later down the line. That absolutely is a possibility. 
that, you know, maybe they're just focusing on these nine core factions at the beginning and later down the line we're going to have loads of Dark Elves and Demons and all the rest of it and it's all going to be tickety-boo. Another thing would be PDF legacy rules. They're not necessarily bad. So, 6th edition players will remember Ravening Hordes. Ravening Hordes was a get-you-by army list because there was a hard reset in the Warhammer rules at the end of 5th edition Everything had to be changed. There was no portability between the 5th Ed Army books and 6th edition. So all of the armies at the beginning got these Ravening Horde kind of lists. And then um, all of them eventually, or I think almost all of them, got army books that replaced them over the you know, fairly long period that 6th edition was alive. And so presumably something like this is going to happen now. And those Ravening Horde armies weren't actually that bad. Many of them were actually quite nicely balanced. They were quite abbreviated. They were a little bit vanilla. But, you know, they were probably free from some of the more excessive kind of brokenness uh, that we've seen in other editions or we saw later in 6th edition. And so some players really rather idolise Ravening Hordes. Although it did rather work best when you had two Ravening Hordes armies playing against each other. So these kind of army lists that are kind of centrally um, sort of produced and aren't done in army books, which is also what happened in third edition, for example, as well, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that the rules themselves won't be very good. Right, now some scepticism. So it could be argued by the sceptics, and as I say, I am probably one of them in this regard, that these PDF legacy rules probably won't be play-tested as thoroughly as the core armies. So they might not be as good. Or maybe if they are as good, they might be, similar to Ravening Hordes was, a bit bland, a bit low on special rules, a bit vanilla. And, you know, it might give rather a more conservative kind of feel to the PDF legacy factions, where they won't have stuff doing interesting things on the tabletop to such a degree. There's also the fear of power creep, that these armies that are placed in these PDF legacy supplements aren't going to be as good as ones that actually get army books, because there's always been power creep in Games Workshop products. This is true in fantasy, it's true in 40k, that as new army books get released, that the desire is to make them the most powerful army yet, partly to encourage people to buy them. And so people playing the PDF Legacy armies are going to have a hard time of things competitively. I think that's probably likely to be true, um, but there it is. Maybe it doesn't matter to you. Maybe you just um, care about a fluff game and you know narrative gaming, and that's probably going to be a lot of people. But if you do care a lot about the competitive side of things, Probably, although not definitely, you're going to be wanting to have one of the core factions rather than strutting around with your PDF legacy faction army. The next one, I think, is that they kind of created two tiers by this. That you've got the core factions that are going to be driven by the very, very power powerful narrative engine of Games Workshop creating fluff, releasing models, releasing campaign sets. Um, they're going to have that focus and the PDF legacy factions aren't really going to have that. So if you are one of these PDF faction dudes, you're probably not going to meet that many new players who have started collecting those factions. Now I am assuming that Games Workshop are going to release the old model lines for these legacy factions. So you are actually going to be able to buy the 8th edition models. I'm assuming that that's the case. But without that kind of support, you're probably not going to find as many new players playing those armies. And so perhaps that's OK. Perhaps you like being the only guy who's the Dark Elf player, you know, or the only guy who's the Chaos Dwarf player, something those guys are pretty used to as it is. So you won't have that kind of camaraderie of other players maybe collecting the same army that you are if the focus is very strongly towards the nine supported kind of factions. Then... There's another point, which is more some of my analysis. So some people on like the Warhammer the Old World Facebook group have kind of been arguing about this, some people being, you know, really positive, some people being really negative, and some people complaining about complaining, and then complaining about complaining about complaining. This is the internet, guys, by the way, here. It's just the way things kind of are. That, um, that I think that some of the language that Games Workshop used doesn't fill me with huge confidence. So when they talked about the PDF legacy factions, to start with, they're called legacy factions. 
When you hear something that's legacy or a legacy edition, it sort of implies that it's something for kind of, I don't know, old people who want to keep using an old thing. Like a landline is a bit like a legacy kind of product. It also says that they're being released as a service to fans. Not because Games Workshop want to, as a service to them, to be nice. And also, which is the term I suppose I take the most umbrage to, for old time's sake. Old times? Old times are the whole reason why I'm in this whole shebang. Old times are very important. Really, that's where I'd like to go back to. But there's a lot of sentimentality in wargaming. There's a lot of interest in the history of the game, in the history of Gamers Workshop. You know, people who have been gamers for a long time really trace their lives through the games that they've played, you know, and their time collecting Warhammer. You don't just play one of your PDF legacy factions for old time's sake. You play it because you're a dark elf at heart, because you're a slan at heart, you know, because you are, maybe in your dreams, a little part of you is an ogre tyrant. It's not something that, you know, people just kind of really choose, you know, like it's something on the menu. Something in here, something in people's hearts. And that's not something you do for old time's sake. But aside from that, maybe I'm slightly over-interpreting the language. But I do think that it would have been very easy for Games Workshop to have thrown a bone to some of these fans who were probably obviously going to be disappointed that their armies weren't being supported. They could have just simply said... They're not going to be the focus of our initial stuff, but down the line, perhaps we will. And that would have been enough. That would have been enough to have done that. Wouldn't have committed Gamers Workshop to anything, and they could have easily said that. But instead, it's legacy armies for old time's sake and a service to fans. That language doesn't fill me with enormous confidence. But, you know, at the end of the day, the market is what speaks. And if this game does very well and fans are literally banging down the door, you know, so they can charge their witch star across the table with its cauldron of blood and, you know, with Marathi in support and all the rest of it. And they want supported rules for that that aren't from a PDF legacy. Then, yeah, they'll do it. But probably the market will have to demand it first. There are also, I think, some fluff reasons they give on why these certain factions aren't returning. And I got to admit... I'm pretty sceptical about some of these reasons. So first of all, we're told the vampire counts aren't there because the Von Karstens are dead after the Vampire Wars. Okay, Von Karstens are only one of the vampire bloodlines. What about Lamians? What about Strigoi? What about Blood Dragons? What are they up to? Dark Elves are an insular race? Yeah, sure. Haven't they got a lot of pirates? They do that kind of thing, don't they? They get about a bit. Chaos Dwarves insular as well? I thought Chaos Dwarves fought quite a lot of wars with orcs and goblins trying to enslave them. Ogres? Ogres fought fight for anyone, don't they? They're really kind of mercenary in their nature. And as for demons, apparently they just don't appear very much anymore because the chaos is at a low ebb. Well, they can still appear if they want to, you know. No one said anything about demons being a particularly common army on the tabletop. I imagine even in the end times, armies... With demons were probably not as common as orc armies, for example. So I'm not really sure I buy any of those things. But the point is, is that I think these are rationalizations after the fact. Games Workshop have decided not to support these armies, and they've given us some sort of fluff reasons as to why um, they're not being supported. But as I say, I think it's a post hoc justification. I think it's there um, uh, to limit um, the focus to nine factions. And we might ask, why is that? It could be because of budget. It could be because Warhammer the Old World is not having the budget put into it that perhaps we might hope that it would be. And they're only going to be focusing on a smaller number of factions and they're going to be using a lot of old 8th edition kits and a few new ones alongside it. And, you know, that in some respects, if that was true, it would be a little disappointing, but I don't really mind that. I always expected this to be a bit of a boutique product from Games Workshop. But that could be a reason why they're only focusing on the nine. Other things like shelf space, I suppose, could be an issue. And, and here's a conspiracy, maybe X-rated content. Perhaps they don't want those demons of Slanesh or Morathai or the witch elves prancing around on the table. And that might be one of the reasons why they're not there. I don't really believe that, by the way, but it's just something that um, I noticed. But anyway, I think there's probably a commercial reason why they're doing this, and the fluff is being given as an excuse um, uh, rather than is the actual leader of it. 
But I just think more broadly, though, I did want to just offer some kind of philosophy in closing. Now, I've been a little bit, maybe a little bit negative in some of the things that I've said um, here, because I am sceptical and being involved with Games Workshop as a hobbyist for many years has made me realise that amongst all the joy, all the incredibly happy memories that um, this company's activities have brought to me, there has also been frustration and disappointment along the way. It's very much like a sibling relationship. There's some love and there's some hatred there as well. Now, when I first heard about the old world, I did think, and I did say on a, you know, say this video from three years ago, that I knew there were going to be things about the new system that I didn't like. And there are some now. I don't like the base changes. I don't like the fact that there's two tiers of core and PDF legacy factions. I don't like some of the rumours I've heard about some of the rules, such as you know, having not random charges and pre-measuring at the same time. You've got to have one of those or the other or it's a bit rubbish. So I don't like some of those things. But at the end of the day, remember the core, um, not the core factions, the core um, points that we've really got here. One, we're getting a game. That didn't look very likely a few years ago. And that game is going to be the successor to Warhammer Fantasy Battle. And it's going to be a proper successor. It will be an addition, you know, with these, you know, armies, troop types, the fundamentals of Warhammer that we have known and loved since third edition will all be part of this game. And that's fantastic. Also, you know, they're not pushing the old players out. Sure, it might be PDF legacy. Sure, the bases might have changed, but there are ways you can get around all that. And you can still use your old armies to fight battles against players in the old world. And that's fantastic. And, you know, in my deepest heart, did I really expect Games Workshop now to be able to best, you know, the work of Richard Halliwell, Rick Priestley, Tumas Pyrrhonen, Nigel Stillman, Alessio Cavatore, or Jervis Johnson? Did I expect that those really very, very great men would be bested by, you know, the new generation of Games Workshop games designers? No, of course I didn't think that. But that's because I'm old and sceptical. Maybe there's someone brilliant in Games Workshop now. Maybe they're a team of many brilliant people, a new generation of great game designers who are going to give us something that's better than even those great men were able to deliver. But I doubt it. But even if I'm right, at the end of the day, even if Warhammer the Old World is the worst edition of Warhammer Fantasy, it's still going to be an amazing game. And it's still going to be absolutely fantastic that it's supported. And so I don't really care that much about some of these things. Even this core and PDF legacy and base sizes, all of those things ultimately are still window dressing, even though some of it does, you know, slightly sour the pudding sometimes. You know, I've actually really enjoyed um, playing 8th edition even after it was dead. I'm quite kind of co comfortable with that. I've got gamers that play, you know, because I live in London and there are a lot of people around who play, organised my own tournament, really still enjoying it, even though I only play two armies. And, you know, I could play probably hundreds more games of 8th edition and still never get bored. But there's all something a little bit insular to all that. It feels like a kind of, I don't know, a society where... There are no kids, where people are just getting older together, a children of men kind of scenario. And even though I might enjoy playing my regular opponents and playing in this very stable meta, where nothing changes and nothing's new, I do still yearn to hear the words, here comes a new challenger. And that's a reference there for some of the grey beards. So I've got my demon on here again. Here he is. Hello, mate. So I want to ask you a question. So are you going to be a demon prince from a core faction or are you going to be a keeper of secrets from a PDF legacy faction? Oh, he said he accused me of demon essentialism and said that he can identify as whatever he likes. Yeah, sure, mate. Yeah, it's 2023. You, absolutely. You can identify as you like. But is it going to be anything tactical about what you identify as? Oh, yeah. The most broken thing. Well, that's hardly really a surprise, is it? So, the crazy train continues to puff forwards. And well, what a ride it's been. A very long-winded one, but it's getting a bit bumpy in the carriage, isn't it? So, see you at the next station for more.